Now, the book of Genesis, we read how that God breathed the breath of life into Adam and he became a living soul. It was the wind of God. It was the breath of God that brought life to Adam. The prophet Ezekiel says these words, prophesy unto the wind, son of man. Listen to this. Thus saith the Lord God, come ye four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they might live. Ezekiel implored the wind of God to come and to blow upon that valley of dry bones, those lifeless corpses. And when the wind came and blew, they rose up an exceeding mighty army. Jesus said, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and you hear the sound thereof. But you can't tell where it's coming from, and you can't tell where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Things are going to happen when the wind of God blows that would never happen under normal conditions. And I want you to look in the book of Acts real quick here this afternoon. Chapter 2 and verse 1, very familiar uh, portion of scripture here. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. Oh man, what a, what, 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 what a passage. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. Notice what it says right here. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2. Read it out loud. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Now look at that right there. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the house where they were sitting. Now the roaring breath of God, the wind of God blew here at Pentecost as we well know. Now the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is represented by two elements wind and fire and it was the sound of a rushing mighty wind that signified the coming of the spirit at pentecost it was the breath of god it was the very breath of god that inaugurated the dawn of a new era at pentecost it was the wind of the spirit that took the element of fire and blew the blew the gospel to the ends of the earth jesus said in john chapter 15 i will pray the father and he will give you yet another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now notice what Jesus said. I'm going to give you another one just like me. I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to give you another comforter. And notice it says, I will abide with you forever. Now in Acts 1, Jesus told the disciples uh, to wait in the upper room for the promise of the Father. They were to wait for this promise. Jesus didn't tell them to witness. He didn't tell them uh, to preach. He didn't tell them to plant churches. He told them to wait for the promise of the Spirit. Now, these men in that upper room, these men and women, they had a date with destiny. They, 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 they were there to wait and anticipate the coming of the Holy Spirit. William Graham Scroggie, the old, the great expositor, said that the sin of the Old Testament was the rejection of God the Father. He said the sin of the New Testament was the rejection of God the Son. But the sin of the church age is the rejection of God the the Holy Spirit. All Christians have been to Calvary for pardon, but how few have ever been to Pentecost for power? It says here in verse 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I want to give you five things this afternoon that are blown away when the wind of God blows. Five things that are demolished and blown away when the Holy Spirit comes in power. So the message this afternoon is gone with the wind. Number one, gone with the wind. When the Holy Spirit comes in power, gone with the wind is a cowardice in witnessing. A cowardice in witnessing. Now look in chapter 3 or chapter 2 verse 3. There appeared unto them clothed tongues as a fire and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now, here they are, filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in these languages whereby everybody could hear and understand in their own tongue. Now, in Acts chapter 4, and welcome to you Baptists on Baptist Standard Time. Come on in the house, boys. Come on in the house. Hey, stand up if you got an open seat. Stand up if you got an open seat. All right, y'all come on in. All right, the rest of the latecomers stand in the back. All right, y'all come on in and have a seat right here. All right, if you do that right there. 
Now in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, listen to, listen to their prayer. Verse 29. Grant unto thy servants that they may speak thy word with boldness. They were praying for boldness. In Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Do you understand that one evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit is a compulsion to win other people to Christ? Now, before Pentecost, Peter uh, denied the Lord. He denied him three times. But after Pentecost, he was willing to rebuke thousands and boldly proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Now, in Acts chapter 2, Peter preached that mighty message. Prior to this, he was intimidated by a slave girl. You know, the Bible tells us when he was confronted, you're one of his followers, and he cursed and he swore and he denied the Lord. But after the wind of God blew, he bellowed out at Pentecost, this same Jesus whom you have crucified hath he made both Lord and Christ. And I'm telling you, he was unashamed of Jesus. He mightily declared the gospel. And it said, you say, well, what happened to this guy? What happened? Did he go to a soul winning seminar? Acts 1 and verse 8, listen to this. But you shall receive dynamite power after that the Holy Ghost has come unto, unto you and you shall be witnesses unto me all over the place. It was the coming of the Spirit that made the difference. Now on Pentecost, Peter, Peter preached one sermon and had 3,000 saved. Today we preach 3,000 sermons and we're fortunate to see one person saved. Now what is the problem? The main problem is not a lack of training. Uh, the main problem is not, uh, is not that we don't understand the facts of the gospel. The main problem is a lack of compulsion to speak up for Christ. And the main problem is a lack of the fullness of the Spirit of God. That's the main problem. But when the wind comes, gone with the wind is a cowardice in witnessing. Point two, gone with the wind is a coldness in worship. A coldness in worship. I'll tell you, I go into churches sometimes. If I didn't go around and shake hands, I wouldn't get my hands shook. If I didn't smile at somebody, nobody would smile at me. W.P. Nicholson said he went in a church one time that was so cold. He said, if you came in the back door with a quart of milk, it would turn to ice cream before you reached the pulpit. That's pretty cold. Pretty cold. You know, up in Canada, the ground freezes, so the, the undertakers, they can't dig in the frozen uh, earth, so they have to find a place to store corpses. So in the old days, they would rent the basements of churches to store the dead bodies to wait for the spring thaw. They were so cold in those basements. I'm pretty sure I preached in a number of those churches. <laughs> now, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, it says, they continued steadfastly. That means they persevered earnestly. Uh, they continued diligently in the apostles' doctrine uh, and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice the four pillars of the early church. It was not programs. <laughs> the four pillars of the early church were doctrine. Ambiguity was over. They knew whom they had believed. They continued in fellowship. And I'm not talking about talking about the Green Bay Packers and what's wrong with the current administration. And I'm telling you, the fellowship in our churches is so shallow. And, and I'm telling you, brother, we, they had deep soul fellowship. They were, they were talking about the things of God and they were pouring out their hearts before the Lord and one another. They continued in fellowship. Notice they continued in breaking of bread and they continued in prayers. I'm telling you, when the wind blew, the days of impotent praying were over. The early church was ablaze with the presence of God. And I believe that one of the greatest hindrances uh, to effective evangelism are cold, dead worship services. (laughs) You know, when the countenances in the congregation look like a reprint of the book of Lamentations, it's time to get a facelift. Amen? (laughs) Amen. And it's unlikely anybody's going to get born again in a bound up, stiff atmosphere where the whole crowd looked like they're sitting on a curtain rod or something like that. I was in a meeting one time. I was in a meeting one time and God got in it. Always going to be in town when God is. Amen. One lady got in a prayer meeting. We had 250, 300 people praying. One lady said, oh God. She said, Lord, this is just as exciting as going to the amusement park. Another lady met me on the way out that morning. She said, who needs drugs when you can have salvation? (laughs) I'm telling you, brother, uh, it was a place of excitement. Now, if we want to duplicate Pentecostal power, we need to enter into some Pentecostal praise as in the book of Acts. Now, Peter preached his way into jail and the church prayed him out. Paul and Silas preached their way into jail and they praised their way out. 
And I want to tell you, when word got around town about that spiritual jailbreak, you can better believe the services were packed out and the early church had an atmosphere about it full of anticipation. Nobody knew what was going to happen next. And I want to tell you that cold ritualistic services will remain a barrier to evangelistic growth. But gone with the wind will be cold worship services when the wind blows. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is alive. <laughs> And we need to live like it. We need to witness like it. We need to work like it. And we need to worship like it. And that's why tomorrow night when our hearts are all cleansed, you're going to hear some men with some unbridled praise going on in here. And I'm telling you, this is what heaven's going to be like, only multiplied by a billion times with all those people up there. And I want to tell you, brother, you don't have to sing like you mean it because you can sing when you mean it, when your heart is clear and you're full of the Spirit of God. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verse 13, they didn't know what to make of them. And they said, they were mocking. They said, these men are full of new wine. <laughs> They're drunk. The world didn't know what to, what, how to account for the apostles because they weren't acting normal. <laughs> they were under the influence of the Holy Spirit. They accused them of being drunk. Now, think about it. G. Campbell Morgan said, when was the last time somebody accused you of being drunk on your Christianity? Brother, they were living under the influence. Now, the early atmosphere in the early church was indescribable. There was praise in the midst of persecution. There was life in the air. They were electric with anticipation. Now, let me give you just a few points right here. These are too good to pass over. They had godly fear. Godly fear. Not cold, dead, sir. Godly fear. Listen to this. Fear came upon every soul uh, because uh, many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Ananias and Sapphira got struck dead. All right there, I'll tell you what, that, that shake up the business meeting, amen? Some character fell out of the window and he died and the, Paul went out and raised him to life again. And I want to tell you that miracles possess a drawing power that reason can't explain. They had godly fear, but listen to this, they had generous giving, generous giving. Verse 45, and all the believed were together and had all things common and they sold their possessions and goods without a stewardship month. Say amen on that point right there. Where do we come up with this stuff? Listen, boy, you're going to get in trouble here. But uh, they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Listen to what they had, unspeakable joy. I know some of you can relate to this. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And they had explosive evangelism. Listen to verse 47. Praising God, having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church. Daily, such as should be saved. My friend, when gone with the wind will be coldness in worship services. And when the spiritual temperature rises, the iceberg melts. When the wind blows, brother, you put up the snowsuit and you bring out the short sleeves. Or when the wind blows, you get rid of the stocking cap and you bring out the sunglasses. I'm telling you, you put off the sackcloth uh, and put on the garment of praise. Now in Acts chapter 3, there was a lame man healed. I mean, this guy got healed. And the Bible says he leaping up. He didn't stand up, brother. He jumped up. He le leapt up and walked and entered into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were filled with wonder and amazement. You know what we need to see in our churches, brother? We need to see some things happen on a spiritual level that are so miraculous that it fills our hearts with wonder and amazement. Now, I'm telling you, in revival, you've got holy wonder. In revival, brother, you have holy amazement. Now, I mean, there's just enlightenment. There's enlivenment. We're seeing things we've never seen before, and God's doing a mighty work. Oh, my friend, gone with the wind will be coldness in worship. But listen to this one. Number three, when the wind of God blows, gone with the wind will be a contention in their walk. A contention in their walk. Now, conflict over non-essentials are gone with the wind. Now, let me tell you something. There's not a, there's not a thousand essentials. There's not even a hundred essentials. There's eight or ten things that, brother, we're not going to negotiate on. But I want to tell you, not every preference is a biblical absolute. Do you have an amen in the house on that point? <laughs> Contention in their walk. Acts chapter 1 says they were, were in one accord in one place. And the whole crowd was together. The Bible says in Acts 2, they had singleness of heart. Acts 4, they were of one heart and one soul. Vance Havner said, when the tide is out, every shrimp has its own puddle. 
In most towns in America, the Baptists, they got their own puddle. We're not kingdom minded. No, 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 no. We're national minded. We're, 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 we're click minded. We're institutional minded. We're group minded. But brother, we better get kingdom minded. I want to tell you, division and contention are hindrance, hindrances to an evangelistic church. You, you can't fish and fight at the same time. Any fisherman knows that a commotion is going to scare all the fish away. And when there's contention among the brethren, I'm going to tell you, it, it's a killer. There was a Boston newspaper that carried the article about a, a christening party in a, in a home where the family invited their friends and relatives to come and to celebrate the christening of their newborn, son, their newborn child, their newborn son. The party was going along. Everybody was eating and fellowshipping and having a great time when somebody said to the mother, by the way, oh, where's the baby? And when she heard that, she jumped to her feet, ran into the master bedroom, and began to dig down through the coats and the wraps of the guest. And there she found her newborn son, dead, smothered by the coats of the guest. He was the main attraction. He's why they all came. But he was, he was smothered by the coats of the guest. And here we are in the 21st century, smothered by the garments of unnecessary conflict. Now, in the upper room, they got rid of the religious clutter. Uh, they got down to the irreducible minimum. Jesus Christ was the chief cornerstone. They were so obsessed with the resurrected Christ that in the presence of Jesus, they couldn't squabble over secondary issues. Now, the Bible addresses this. Listen to this. When the wind blows, we get beyond doubtful disputations, Romans chapter 14. That's arguments over non-essentials. When the wind of God blows, we get beyond foolish and unlearned questions of which gender strife. When the wind blows, we shun profane and vain babblings which increase to more ungodliness. When the wind of God blows, we don't give heed to Jewish fables or the commandments of men. Now listen, when the wind blows, the commandments of men, carnal arguments, doubtful disputations, profane and vain babblings, fables and the tradition of men are all blown out of the window when the wind of God blows. Now let me give you some particulars. Contention in the walk. What are you talking about? I'm talking about petty jealousies. Petty jealousies. See, prior to Pentecost, you know, the disciples were posturing for position. No, James, John and James said to Jesus, hey, grant us that one might sit on the right hand and another on the left hand. But when the Holy Spirit came and put an end to this fleshly posturing, and I want to tell you, they weren't fighting about who got to preach at Pentecost. Uh, Peter just stood up there and preached the gospel and they all rejoiced. Andrew Bonner said, the Christ in me will not fight with the Christ in you. The Christ in me will not fight with the Christ in you. And I want to tell you, if you're fighting with the brethren all the time, it ain't Jesus fighting with them. It's somebody else in there doing the fighting. You know, when revival's in the air, you're not going to be fighting with your family members. It's our Father. It's give us. Forgive us. It's deliver us. You know, in a revival atmosphere, everybody's so thrilled to be a part of the family of God that nobody has the inclination to find fault with their brothers and sisters in Christ. And these contentious jabs over personal preferences are non-existent when the wind blows. Listen, friend, uh, when a church is knee-deep in love, it covers a multitude of transgressions. And just because you don't agree with somebody on every point, can't you appreciate the good points if they've got any? Say amen right there. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about ecumenical compromise. That's not what I'm talking about. But the kingdom is bigger than your group, and I don't care what group you're in. And if you get out of the country, you'll find out, brother, the kingdom's a whole lot bigger than you ever thought it was. Now listen, when personal preferences instead of biblical principles become the acid test for fellowship, you can be pretty certain that the wind is gone. Now in the book of Acts, they had to deal with issues, but they pared it all down. It was pretty simple. They told them to avoid fornication and things offered to idols. And I want to tell you, my friend, uh, petty jealousies will go. Number two, a contention in the walk. When the wind of God blows, the desire for revenge will be gone. The desire for revenge. A Quaker one time was milking his cow. That cow took his old filthy, dirty tail and swiped the Quaker right in the face. He had to pour the milk out. He tried it again, and the cow took, uh, took his foot and stepped right in the middle of the milk bucket. He had to pour that out. He tried doing it again, and about that time, the cow kicked him out of the barn. 
into a heap of unclean blessings out in the barnyard. <laughs> Quaker picked himself up, cleaned himself off, came back in, and he said to the cow, he said, Thou knowest that I am a Quaker, and I cannot be angry with thee or hit thee, but I can sell thee to a Baptist, and he'll beat the devil out of you. <laughs> Gone with the wind is the desire for revenge. You know, after Pentecost, you don't find Peter chopping anybody else's ear off. And I want to tell you, when the Spirit of God comes in power, you're not going to find Christians cutting off each other's heads over, over things that really don't matter. Let me give you a third thing. Gone with the wind, contention in the walk, or carnal divisions. Carnal divisions. Now, I was up in Maine at a church one time. I, you, you know, back in those days, I was bold. And I said, the pastor wanted me to come. I said, all right, if you want me to come, here's what I want you to do. I want a prayer meeting every day for 30 days. The men every day, the women every day, the young people every day praying for 30 days. And they did everything. I said, I said okay, we'll come. Well, no wonder God showed up in a place like that. The second week into the meeting, uh, the two years prior, they'd had a church split. And the people that had split out went down the road about five miles, four or five miles, and started another church. Now, on Tuesday night, I think it was Tuesday night of the following week or Wednesday in the second week, they decided they needed to send a delegation from the home church to the split church to ask them for forgiveness for the sorry attitudes they had had toward them after they had left. And we sent a delegation out of our meeting to go to their meeting, and they got their consciences cleared and got that situation taken care of. Now, listen, when you're consumed with Jesus, you're not worried about what's wrong with the other man. Gone with the wind. Number four, listen to this. Unbiblical extremes. Yeah, you heard it right. Unbiblical extremes. We're living in days where we either got snobs or slobs. We're living in days when if you're not a uh, a Pharisee, you tend to be a Sadducee. We have those who will spiritualize compromise, and then we have those that will compromise spirituality. But when Jesus is the center of attention, you're not going to get hung up over non-essentials because love covers a multitude of transgressions. Francis Schaeffer said that you can be doctrinally pure in the flesh. You can be doctrinally pure in the flesh Or you can have compassion in the flesh, but you can only do both in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a balance here. Now, truth out of balance is falsehood. And every truth in the Word of God has a balancing truth. But when we magnify one truth above all other truth, it becomes an untruth. And I want to tell you, the narrow way is just not narrow enough for some people. So they want to pare it on down more than what it already is. And for other people, the narrow way is too big, so they, they want, or too narrow, so they want to stretch the gate, man, to get everybody in. And I'm here to tell you, there's a difference between Mother Teresa and the Apostle Paul. Amen. See, I might get in the flesh on this point right here. But any, anyhow, there's a tension in the Scripture to keep us from extremes. Now, Jesus was full of grace and... He wasn't full of grace, and he wasn't full of truth. He was full of grace and truth. And brother, when we're full of grace and we're full of truth, I want to tell you something. Uh, the, these, uh, these contention in the walk is gone with the wind. Let me give you this one right here. Ungodly prejudices. Yeah, ungodly prejudices. Carnal. Well, you know, you know, when the love of God filled Peter's heart, he got over his carnal superiority. He got over his self-righteousness. He got over his fear of touching the unclean Gentiles when he had that vision of that of those unclean animals come down, you know, and he went off to be the apostle to the, to the Gentiles. Now, listen, if you've got a chip on your shoulder, it'll get blown off when the wind of God blows. And I'm telling you, there's no place for prejudice in the house of God. You know what we need? Brother, we need a, vi- a vision of the sea of human need that's around us. We never have our hearts opened up to see. I want to tell you the problem is not political preferences. The problem is not race. The problem is we get all out of sorts with God and each other when the wind of God ceases to blow. We're living in America where the Christian people are all mad at sinners because they're being true to their nature. Why don't we get mad at ourselves for not being true to our new nature in Christ? 
By the way, no extra charge, no extra charge right here. When Jesus came on the scene, what was Israel looking for? A political Messiah. They were looking for a change of political leadership. They were looking to overthrow Rome. They wanted Jesus to set up the throne. He only said two things about uh, politics, by the way. Pay your taxes and tell that old fox Herod where to get off. That's all he ever said about it. He didn't seem to have a lot to say about it. And you know something? When the Spirit of God came at Pentecost, you don't find one political, moral majority rally anywhere in the Word of God. You just don't find it. And I, I, I'm not trying to be hateful here because I'm as concerned as everybody else. But I want to tell you, friend, our problem, our problem cannot be solved, maybe at all, but the kingdom of God is doing just fine. And I'm telling you, they can't pass a law that's going to shut us up. They can't tell us not what, to, not what to do. The early church went on under fierce persecution, and God blessed them in an incredible way. Let's get our eyes off Capitol Hill and back on a hill called Calvary. All right, let me give you another thing. Gone with the wind is a carnality of words. A carnality of words. Now, brother, these unnecessary comments, I want to think, tell you that things happen in revival. Uh, when revived people, they become so extremely conscious of the presence of God, they become extremely sensitive about their speech. You know, when you're in the white heat of, white heat of God's presence, you don't go spouting off at the mouth like I do so often. You know, they said in the Canadian revival, Esther Satura told me that sometimes that the presence of God was so thick that nobody could speak a word, not even the preachers and the moderators on the platform. And I want to tell you, when the wind of God blows, brother, uh, carnality of words. Listen, these contention sins grieve away the spirit of God in the first place. And when the wind of God blows, they're gone. Let me give you this one. Gone with the wind, not only a contention in their walk, but gone with the wind is a complacency in the work. A complacency in the work. Can you make that a little brighter? All right. Uh, uh, the complacency with God's word was gone. <laughs> We're all right. We're all right. We're all right. <laughs> a complacency in the work. Am I getting sunglasses? Uh, now listen to this. No, we're good. Paul warned everyone day and night with tears. They were going from house to house preaching Jesus Christ. You know, they tell me that a door-to-door doesn't work anymore. You ever heard that? You ever said that? Tell that to that church in California that visits 400,000 doors a year and gone from 19 to 5,000. Tell them that and see, what, see if they'll believe it. Now listen, Stephen was ordained a deacon, but you never find him doing the work of the deacon. You find him doing the work of an evangelist. He was a red-hot soul winner. Now brethren, are our lives marked by complacency or by commitment? Let me ask you something. Uh, what are you contributing to the work of God in your, your, your neighborhood, in your church, and in your sphere of influence? I, I had a guy call me from California, and, and somebody told him about me. I didn't know this guy from Adam, and he said, I want to come and visit you. I said, well, I'm coming to California. We'll just have lunch. Well, come to find out, this guy uh, was a, a missionary for, for years down in, um, down in uh, Central America. I never heard of this guy. And he works with all these tribal people, these Indian people, you know, these, uh, uh, in, in that area. And, and he, he told me he preached to 100, over 100,000 Christian leaders in, in five years. He said, I want you to go down and talk about revival. I said, I don't know the language. I don't know the culture. I don't know anything about it. I got nothing to say. No, no, we want you to go. I said, well, you play, pay for the plane ticket. Me and my wife will come. So we went. He picked us up at the airport. And he had led the cab driver to Christ before they got to the airport. We did a, we did a six-hour run from, from Guatemala City to another city. And I listened as he witnessed in Spanish to the cab driver and got him praying, going down the highway, receiving Christ as his Savior. We got to the hotel and, uh, and, and, and the staff all came around because he's won over half of the staff in the Holiday Crown Plaza, Holiday Inn Crown Plaza, won over half of the staff to Christ. And they all come around. It was kind of like a, the, he was a father in the faith. And he told me his testimony. He was a missionary. He had lost his wealth. He had lost his health. He had lost his way. He told me he got backslidden for 10 years. He told me he got addicted to po- Internet pornography. But you know what? He got revived. And I want to tell you something, friend. Failure was not final with the God of the impossible. And you might be on the bottom of the stack right now, but brother, I'm telling you, God can raise you up and put you back in circulation. 
And complacency will be replaced with commitment uh, when an individual relinquishes control of his life, my friend. Gone with the wind. But let me give you this one. Gone with the wind is a casualness in, in prayer. A casualness in their wants. A casualness in prayer. Now, if you study the book of Acts, you'll find 10 corporate prayer meetings. You'll find 38 references uh, to prayer, at least in the book of Acts, 53 references to the Holy Spirit. And wherever you find the Holy Spirit, you find people praying. And I want to tell you that upper room encounter so changed those present that they never were the same again. And I want to tell you, man, that upper room prayer meeting, I'd love to have been there. I know they were taking the witness stand against their own hearts. Let there be light. I'm telling you, I, I know they were doing that. This was not a tame affair like a typical Wednesday night where we give our request instead of praying our request. And got 95 physical needs and zero spiritual needs. I'd like, to see, I'd like to see a prayer request for the glory of God on a prayer bulletin one time. I'd like to see that. But anyhow, uh, brother, I'm telling you, they met the Lord and after that upper room encounter, you find them praying on the rooftop, on the seashore, in the jail, in the prison, in the homes. You find them praying everywhere. You find them praying about everything, and you find them praying all the time. One pastor asked this particular pastor who had two to 3,000 people coming out every week for midweek prayer meeting. And this one pastor said, how do you get thousands of people to come and pray? And the other pastor said, when your pe- people believe that God answers prayer, it's no problem to get them to come. We are baptized in unbelief. We have wrote our dispensations uh, clear to put God out of business in some cases, my friend. Now, all of that's good in moderation, but I want to tell you something. When we get to the point where we're not expecting anything and we're not believing anything, we might meet day and night, but I'm telling you, brother, if God isn't in the midst, what difference does it make? Nothing's going to happen. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick of the program, and I'd like to see the glory of God come back into the house of God. That's what I'd like to say. And I want to tell you, we can't control all that. That might be the problem right there. Now, listen, listen. Uh, what, what, what happens? What happens? Well, one of the great marks that God is about to do the work, a great work, is he pours out a spirit of prayer and he sets his people praying. Now, before God is going to invade the community, the saints are going to have to get stirred up in the church. No more sleepy prayer meetings. No more sedated prayer meetings. Uh, away with prayerless praying, away with non-expectancy in prayer, away with casualness in prayer. You know, in the early church, the burden of God was weighing on their hearts. The burden of God was resting on their hearts. Now, I want to ask you, do you carry a prayer burden? Do you carry a prayer burden? Can, can God trust you to carry the pain of, of his own heart about the situation that we're in right here? You know, to see God move, somebody's going to have to get under the burden of God. And when Nehemiah heard what was going on in his hometown, gates burned with fire, walls busted down and all the rest, the Bible says he sat down and mourned and wept many days. It wasn't a, a two-minute trip to the altar. And we ain't got no altar this week, amen? I mean, we just, we just got no altar. It wasn't a two-minute trip to the altar that didn't amount to a hill of beans. He sat there for days. And he fasted, and he mourned, and he wept. And I want to tell you something. This was not a momentary moving. This was not a flash of emotion. This was something that gripped his heart. And brother, I want to tell you, that was the genesis of God doing something. Now listen, we can't work up a revival, but we can sure set our sails to catch the wind of God when it blows. And that's what we need to do. Now listen, the wind of God came in Acts chapter 2. The breath of God came at Pentecost. We've seen the effects. Gone with the wind. A cowardice in witnessing. Gone with the wind, a coldness in worship. Gone with the wind, a contention in their walk. Gone with the wind, a complacency in the work and a casualness in prayer. How many of you think we ought to just right now ask God to breathe upon this place and to breathe upon us and to send the wind of God to blow over our hearts? Brother, the Bible says, quench not, grieve not, and resist not the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit is offended. I believe God is grieved. And listen, listen, I ain't preaching about the liberals. I'm talking about us. You can have it all together doctrinally. Havner said you can be gun barrel straight spiritually and gun barrel empty spiritually all at the same time. 
And brother, we need for the wind of God to come. We need for the wind of God to come over our hearts. Listen to this great hymn. Listen to this. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Take thou my heart and cleanse every part. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Gone with the wind. You hungry for the wind of God to blow? You desire us to see God do something in our generation? You want to see your church ablaze with the glory of God? Brother, it's the Holy Spirit. I think we ought to appeal to him right now. I want you to bow your heart right now in the presence of God. I don't know how this is going to apply to you. Well, let's just talk to God about what he's talking to us about. A cowardice in worship. A cowardness in witness. A coldness in worship. Complacency in the work. A contention in the walk. Or a casualness in prayer. Let's just talk to the Lord. Because when we repent of the things that cause the Spirit of li- to leave is when we can expect the wind of God to blow again. Just, just talk to Him for a minute right here. Wherever you're at, whatever, whatever you need, wherever your heart's at, open up your heart's door. Invite God the Holy Spirit to come and do a searching work, a cleansing work, a convicting work, an encouraging work, an instructing work, an empowering work. Tell the Lord Jesus that The triune God, including his spirit, is welcome in this place. Now, Heavenly Father, we've heard the best preachers in the world. We got more literature and more resources than any generation in history, I suppose. And Lord, we're not going to ascribe to you how you got to do your work and where you're going to do it and who you're going to do it with. We're just imploring you to come and visit us and touch us. Spirit of God, come. Search me, O oh God. Try me. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, that in these days the word of God would have free course. That you wouldn't be bound up. You wouldn't be grieved. You wouldn't be quenched. You wouldn't be resisted. But Lord, every heart would just be so wide open. And God, you do a powerful work and you change us. We need you, Lord. We really need you, God. We can't make it without you, Lord. We can perpetuate programs and institutions, but God, we can't do anything to affect another human heart apart from the Spirit of God. So, Lord, we're crying out to you this afternoon that, God, you'd visit us again. I pray for every church represented, every pastor, every father, every spiritual leader, every Sunday school teacher, every deacon. Every usher, every man here, every grandfather, God, I pray, oh God, in these days you would so energize our hearts that, Lord, we'd go out of here, not with something that's going to last about five days, but, Lord, we'd go out of here with a, a change, a changed mind that's going to lead to a changed heart, which will lead to a strengthening of the inner man so that our inner man would be stronger than our outer man. And God, we could have victory over sin because we're walking with you. And Lord, we'd exhort one another daily uh, as we see the day approaching. God, that our churches would be like in the book of Acts, one heart and one soul. Oh God, Lord. And, And Father, we're not looking for the place to be shaken, but we're looking for our hearts to be shaken. So Father, we want to thank you right now that you're going to come and visit us. Exercise your faith in prayer and thank God that he's going to meet with us in every session. And deep needs are going to be met. God's going to be glorified. And we're going to get freed up because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's great liberty.